Hello and welcome to another episode of A Ghost in the Magazine. I'm Steph. And I'm Elle. And we're back with Evil Dead 2. So like we've talked about Evil Dead 2 because we watched it when we watched like when we did Evil Dead Rise. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of like fun tidbits. But it was it was good to revisit her because I didn't remember a lot of stuff actually. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite Evil Dead movie and probably one of my top 10 horror movies of all time. So, really? Yeah. I like I might it. E it might even be top five, honestly. I don't know. It's somewhere around there. I'm going to need that top 10. Elle's top 10 picks. I would have to really sit down and, and think about mine. But Evil Dead, it's pretty yeah. up there. This is just like the perfect mix of horror and comedy. And I also feel like it breaks the lore rule really strong. Like, because the fucking, it's fucking nonsensical. At one point they say, we want what you are living. And then they say, we're alive. And then they, you know, like, it just, it doesn't make any fucking sense at all. Um, but it's interesting. It's funny. And the continuity isn't a problem. <laughs> like, I just, just love because that what is the lore rule is like like you're very strong about it. Yes, I'm always like, what are the rules? And I need to know the rules. But this movie proves oh that God. you can break the fucking rules and still be entertaining. That and it has our podcast husband in it. So playing Dead Henrietta, which I was like, where is he? I was wondering who who the fuck. And that makes sense because Dead Henrietta was pretty spicy. Yeah, she was. She says, Come to Henrietta, baby. I have fun facts. It's very, very apparent that there's something mysterious, mysteriously familiar about the beginning of Evil Dead 2. And it's a recap of Evil mm -hmm. Dead 1, but there are people missing. Yeah. Right? And this, this recap is just Ash and Linda mm -hmm. because they like didn't have the rights to the first movie. Mm -hmm. So they had to reshoot. The thing about Henrietta that I wrote, the first gl glimpse we see, there's like these worms coming out of her head that I just thought was so fucking funny. I just, it was beautiful. It was so grotesque, but it was like over the top, you know? Um, And then it, she goes, someone's in my fruit setup someone with a fresh soul yeah. it's just like that oh it's just like so ted raimi too the way that the words come out like when he gets unhinged yeah. in skinner that yes that delivery sam said you know who would be perfect for this shit my brother my fucking brother let's get him in here like what a treat it would be to like be on set for that right that, and you apparently... know that back and forth like ted was so hot in the well i mean he's hot all the time but he was so hot yeah. in the makeup in the like prosthetics and stuff that it was like miserable for him Aww. but i just have to say when he says come to sweet henrietta you know the yes. rules if daddy says come we have to go <laughs> so be right there be at that point like that would he be the end of my uh resistance in this movie just yeet me into the cellar mm -hmm. I thought the prosthetics were very fun. It was giving, like, those close-ups on her, like, lumpy legs. I know you didn't watch The Last of Us, but they have, like, different kinds of infected. And the grossest mm -hmm. one is, like, in level with Big Baby from 13 Ghosts <laughs> is the bloater. It's, like, this big, lumpy, monstrous, infected thing. Ooh. That's what she was like. And I... I just think it's interesting because they were really like pushing the limits. So that leads me to my next fun fact. They were really pushing it. So there were censorship issues with the first and the second Evil Dead yeah. because like it was so violent. You think about when it was made. 
So they were mm-hmm. like contractually obligated to write the movie rated R. So they're having issues with it because they're like, well, I just want it to be the nonsense that lives in my my head, the bloody the bloody nonsense. So like I'm watching it and I'm like, oh, Ash is chopping up this bitch and he's bleeding green goop. I don't think it's that bad. But then you have the the cellar door incident and it's like monsooning uh blood just shooting and pouring out of the cellar doors and i'm like oh there it is yeah i can see that, that it's so over the top and i think that the way that they they do it completely like they just like go a hundred percent in like they do everything with their whole chest they are not mm-hmm. playing around uh Nothing is half measure. And the thing about it that is, is that you have these holes. Like we were talking about the fact that uh, this has lore holes in it that don't make mm-hmm. sense, you know? So the the thing about it is, is I think that when you just have, you, you're just like going with this confidence and just like overblowing everything, there is a humor to it that comes in that is just like mm-hmm. so distracting that it doesn't, the other stuff is just like whatever i don't fucking care i am That's so dramatic. amused <laughs> yes i i am so oh it's such a difference because we just got done talking about a book that's not fun mm-hmm. this this is how i want to write this is the perfect example not Anne rice respectfully not that <laughs> um like one of my my favorite scenes I made a TikTok with it is when all of the the cabin furniture comes alive. There's lamps laughing at him, a deer head, you know, shit's flying around and he's going cuckoo bananas. And we as the viewer are so involved in it. It is just so good. The other thing. <laughs> You know, we talked about the reframing a little bit, um, the way that they, because they lost rights and they lost rights after this, when they went to make Army of Darkness as well. So they had to like reach yeah, some of boys. that. Yeah. They kept working with different studios and like, they would, they would just like lose rights to this stuff before and have to like, that's why there's not really a continuity between the three. I think diehard fans know that. And that, I think maybe that's why like it is such a cult class because they're like you know what that's shitty but it doesn't change what you've done here and so like yeah. we're gonna protect you and we're gonna hold on to you and we're gonna cherish you regardless well I think too like I watched an interview with Guillermo del Toro about this movie too and he talks about how like the camera work was like so life-changing pretty much mm-hmm. and like the way that every it's like this is the way you shoot movies now um, and they did. They came up with a lot of like novel stuff, especially since they didn't have the budget as with with the first movie. So they mm-hmm. came up with a bunch of like just kind of tying shit together and seeing what will come come of it. But the other thing about the framing, which I'm like trying to get back to, like, so when they t- pare it down from like a friend's trip to a romantic getaway, right? And mm-hmm. it's all centered around Ash and Linda. And then you kind of see the way that the possession takes hold. I'm just saying, it seems like a, a the whole fucking thing could be an allegory for falling in love because Ash starts losing his agency and he and, and like the worst thing happens right off the bat of him losing his his love. And and then he every time he like reattaches to someone, something happens. Like the the lady at the end gets stabbed in the back and he's calling her kid just like he called Linda in the beginning and he loses the control of his own hand and he ends up like kicking his own ass in a mirror and all of reality is like melting away around him and it's like completely consuming him and it's this ancient thing that they have awoken (laughs) I'm just saying I'm just I just like I wrote an entire thing and and I think that it's it's hard to explain like to lay out point by point in a succinct way but I could write an essay about it I think you should there's a death cab for cutie song called I will possess your heart I think so it tracks well there's also a follow Troy song from Phantom on the Horizon 
and it's called The Wall's Blood Lust. And I was like, God damn, I wonder if he watched this movie and used it. It's, you know, kind of like, it's more like a hopeless love type of thing. I'd be like that sometimes. Yeah. I was making a lot of the weird, like, tenuous poetic connections to things this morning. Okay, but, like, that's o- that's okay because I was watching this literally from the fa- very beginning. I said out loud, I'm watching it tucked in bed, curled around my iPad. And I said, Evil Dead is poetry. It is. Ash is a fucking poet, okay? It is. It is literal poetry and i was like i'll die on that hill and then here you are backing me up this movie to me like the practical effects this is exactly Mm -hmm. what i want to fucking see when i watch a horror movie a hundred percent the artistry like everything is like the the way everything is set up the mood the fucking sound design the sound design is so unsettling for me um Mm -hmm. It's just like everything, the 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 use of the camera, the perspective that you get from the the viewpoints and stuff, and how, like I said, with Ash, like reality seems to melt away. And even like when the bridge goes out, it couldn't just be like a muddy fucking puddle that obviously no. a shitmobile can't get through. It's a fucking chasm with the bridge curled, curled up. up like a fucking mm-hmm. claw back yep. at him. You know. Very- well, yeah it's just like so visually satisfying and it's just like every image is telling a story there's even a scene where like ash's hand comes back and like tries to kick his ass and he smashes it with farewell to arms <laughs> that is so fucking funny oh my gosh i live for that shit the whole thing with his hand too i really love that i was just watching the latest episode of goosebumps last night the one it's it's actually very good um i was surprised because they have like a main story and then they tie all the books into that main story like every episode is a new book super interesting but like i low-key think justin long is a fool but he plays a teacher in that um and he's like and he's possessed um and he was literally fighting himself so there was an element of him like fighting against his own hand and i like it because just like the camera work i think they did a lot of things here that set precedent for a lot of future movies and even Mm -hmm. and especially the newest evil dead movies i think that they could literally do that oh yeah the other thing about the camera work that i found personally with my with my in my body in this particular body i have issues with like shoddy camera work giving me Mm -hmm. nausea right and some like heidi is really bad like there's some films that i have trouble with this gives me there's there's certain scenes where it gives me a hit of it where it like turns my stomach but it it goes back and it's like actually really steady otherwise and so it kind of like adds to that unsettled feeling because it gives me like a hit of nausea on top of it and i'm very susceptible to sound so like like the fucking there's it's the henrietta scene when for one thing that effect where the neck elongates that reminded me of dick bus from uh hellraiser 2 uh which (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i'm just saying they had to have taken that from that scene there's no <laughs> other way um <laughs> but there's like this unhinged monkey sound in the background and it's like it, it it just totally brought goosebumps up on my arm and i was like who would even think to use that noise there but that's what it is it's like a monkey sound <laughs> like wow. it reminded me of monkey shines <laughs> be on that man <laughs> i was wondering <laughs> because there's a scene well you know one of the iconic things that they do in evil dead is the the camera pan like Mm -hmm. really fast through the forest and like like you're seeing from the entity's pov Mm -hmm. so you do that again but then there when it hits ash he goes flying but Mm -hmm. he's like spinning and his head is spinning different directions i think it's a very cool scene did you get any of it during that 
I don't remember if that's the scene. There was like a couple of scenes where it made me mildly nauseous. It might be that one. Um, I di- I didn't write down when it was, but there was there were definitely a couple of moments where I was just like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like being on the roller coaster. Yeah. Something I like that they did because we were talking about last episode. Um, about the tree violation and how there were yes. other ways that they could have showed and they did exactly that tree yeah. limbs in the mouth I was like yeah that's... and that's probably where I got it from when I said that because I watched this before I just didn't like remember details so I yeah. probably actually got the image from this movie <laughs> still like satisfyingly spooked like yeah. a tree grabbing in the inside of your mouth well, and yeah. it was poking through her skin too, like here, uh, which and was dragged, like that bitch before she died. She had to have gotten like serious red burn, worse than my elbow when I got well, eaten. <laughs> and there were those like little, those little explosions when it was pulling her through the wood, like where she would. Have... Yeah, and she got she hit like a a big puddle of muddy water. Mm-hmm. What a way to go. No thanks. The narrative and the plot maybe isn't super cohesive, but there are all these little interesting bits to it. And one thing that I found really interesting is when there's the four people in there and they have Ash trapped in the cellar, which that's new to this one because his sister's the one trapped in the cellar in the OG. But um, you have like the hillabilly guys, which are like a stereotype. They're just using... But he's smiling, and then the the professor's daughter is there smiling back at him, and her teeth are like perfectly straight, and his are all gapped. And I was like, it's such a, it's just like such an archetype, type, and it's talking about like the different like classes of these characters in like a very visual way that yeah. uh, I just thought was I thought it was interesting. There's just like all these little things that they put into stuff and they really are just dealing with archetypical characters. Even Ash. Ash yeah. is like a like typical macho guy. I think the other interesting thing and this is the other reason why I got on this love angle with this one is because in the first movie Ash's actions and reactions drive the plot. But in this movie, his ass is getting dragged through this fucking plot. It is, he has zero agency compared to the other movie because everything is acting upon him rather than him acting in, or reacting to it, which I thought was a very different framing. Very. And he was kind of like, blah, 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 blah in the last movie. And in this movie, he's like, he's a badass, even yeah. though all of it, like, he's very like, take charge of the situation even though these things are happening to him Mm -hmm. see that man you see that man with the chainsaw ow (laughs) yeah okay here's the things that they were saying what we want is yours life okay dead by dawn and then we live we live still and it's like bitch are you alive or are you dead do you want life or do you want me dead what what are you say like that if they don't stop it by dawn yeah then they die well it's not just that is like i mean dead by dawn comes from the first movie i think they were just pulling it in but obviously he's already survived one dawn like he's right. already made it through it's not even like a finite term they're gonna keep you there to, regardless so. right but it is in um evil dead rise oh yeah like yeah that's fun evil dead rise pulled a lot i think because i do remember the eyeball gag in the eyeball gag is great i love it eyeball had like legs it went so (laughs) far and popped in i like it because the whole scene was just it was kind of silly like Mm -hmm. you know they get ash out and then First of all, Henrietta is like grabbing people by the face, like, and they're all grabbing by the head and the face, like, even when they pulled Ash out, it was by his head. Yeah. And um, so Ash is like, "Oh, okay, one moment," and then like walks around and then jumps on the door of the cellar, like he's a fucking cartoon character. Mm-hmm. And then the eyeball pops out, flies across the room. 
I love it. I can't wait to watch Army of Darkness. It's the only one I have never seen. Yeah, I haven't either. I think that the big thing about this is the unreality of it all. The plot is going where it's going no matter what. And they uh, prime you for this by like how off the wall a lot of the shit is. But like when he goes down into the cellar and picks up those papers and they're like soaking wet and he just tosses them up to her and she catches them and then starts reading them like they're not fucking smeared. Right. Not only that, when shotgun guy takes the pages in the first place, why the fuck would he open the cellar and throw them down there when there's a perfectly good fire burning? And it it even pans to to show the fire too. And and it's like the Chekhov gun thing. Like what? That's what you know. You see the fire, and that's what you think he's gonna do, right? No. It's so like it's so good at like subverting expectations and just going a hundred and ten percent the opposite way, and just fuck, I love this movie. Like. They do so much with every part of the medium, with the writing, with the, uh, the, the camera work, with the scenery, with the special effects. It's just like, what happens if you turn the dial up on every single thing, but you don't give a shit about the plot. (laughs) No, I really don't care. Honestly, as long as Ash like makes it to the end of the movie, I don't care who gets possessed. I don't care whose head he has to chop off. I don't care. You know, yep. he's got a fucking sawed-off shotgun in one hand, and his other hand is a chainsaw. I love it. It's so hot. <laughs> I also think the other thing that is really interesting. Um, possession is like having something like, like, come, like get into your body, you know, and like you lose, you lose agency. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's interesting about it is the way that the thing possesses the environment the same way it possesses the humans yeah it will it it can like it can pretty much alter reality entirely it's like saying almost like you're of the earth in a way that i think no other like horror movie kind of does because it kind of equates the human body to the same thing as the environment and uh it was It was kind of an interesting thing to think about when I was sitting back considering the way that like other possession movies like they tend to just kind of become like more of a scourge of the humans the the cast but this is like a scourge to the whole everything like it's so like um holistic it's taking over everything and it's like humans as not just we're not just special things with a soul everything is uh subject to the destruction which that's interesting yeah i i was like sitting there kind of like playing with that idea and it was like shit i could write poetry about this shit that's the thing about this movie there are so many little like easter eggs and everything and so many different it's so fucking stupid and goofy and yet they managed to say so much and they just like compact everything and like the english teacher that lives in my brain is going yeah. insane trying to figure out all the symbolism. I just but love I, it. It's something very special that they've done here, which mm-hmm. is why every time I see that someone doesn't like the movies, I'm like, I, I really, I would really like to know what about it you don't like. Yeah. Because, you know, all of this, and like to each their own, that's fine. But that's why I say they could do this forever because horror evolves. What people are looking for, it evolves but like evil dead is something that can evolve with Mm -hmm. um, and still keep its true like its true identity so like with the eyeball gag you know the the tree thing the tree violation Mm -hmm. they took some of those elements that were very very silly here and elevate it for elevated it for like the next level of horror fans in the remakes but you still get evil dead at its core when you watch these which is something that i really appreciate because i hate when they just like suck the life out of it like i haven't seen it since it came out in movie theater but the poltergeist remake they gave you what you really wanted because what, when you watch Poltergeist, you really want to know what Carol Ann saw. You want to know what's beyond the white light um, mm. because it centers around the house and they showed it. But 
they didn't give you anything more than that so it was a letdown ultimately this story you can dress up or dress down i think that that's really the thing this is like a little black dress you can dress it up and look like really fancy or you can you know wear some combat boots and look a little punk either way and actually i think I don't remember if it was Del Toro that said that, but he uh, described like the first uh, Evil Dead to like a punk album and the second one to like a symphony covering the punk album. And I think that that is a really good description of it. I like um, that. Yeah. I think that that's a really, really good description. And I would say like the new movies, what they did was they took that OG spirit of it and they still went over the top, but they went yeah. over the top in a way that was more serious and more like not not comedy the way this is do would i love to see another like sequel in this vein i would fucking adore that but it would have to be done right evil dead 2013 had no humor in it for me mm-hmm. at all <laughs> like yeah. at all it's still one of my favorites like it's definitely in my top movies um but evil dead rise some of the shit was ridiculous and so i you know i did so i would if they make another one i would appreciate if they keep going in that direction so there's like even more goofy shit yeah it's still like something that okay (laughs) like gave me a couple heart palpitations there i like that i do want to see the series too because i guess that uh, yeah goofy as fuck yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking is that it was probably more like this, but I want to watch Army of Darkness for the next podcast and then I'll probably start. I watched it. I can't I don't remember how it ends because I watched it. It's been out for a while. I watched mm-hmm. it a minute ago. I had a great time. Bruce Campbell's he's old, but he's still he's got the ash thing. It's just very funny because he's old. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, we love that old man swag. Look at, uh, I mean, fucking Ted Raimi in uh, hotel Dante's Hotel and like... Guy party. Huh? I said old guy party. Yeah, well, like, and, you know, Grandpa Highcock, the OG old man swagger, you know, so I'm just saying, like... You left me at the last bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did. I will never stop freaking up Grandpa Highcock, though. You left me back there with the people who are taller than one foot. Well, bitch is tall, a hundred years old, full of swagger. Nice. Well, Evil Dead Two is perfect. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. This is God as close to five chuds as you can get for me. This is like maybe four chuds. and a half chuds, five chuds. Four point eight. Yep. Five six chuds. It's real it's, close. It's just so good. It's just so good. I'll never not want to watch. Yeah. Did too. Didn't I say that the last movie? I'm never gonna. You know what's so funny is that I had never seen Evil Dead until Evil Dead 2013 came out. Yeah. And boyfriend at the time drove up from daytona to gainesville to take me to see this movie and i said dog i'm scared and i said maybe it'll make me feel better if i watch the original because i heard it's very campy and i was like what the fuck is this what is (laughs) it and i went into 2013 with this in mind and it was not like that and i slept with the lights on that night (laughs) but you know it's had a special place in my heart ever since yeah i love this movie perfect example of knowing the rules and being able to break it it's like jazz this this is arc that's the thing that's the thing it's like every time i hear somebody like compare it to something it's always like artistic and what it comes down to is like this is an example of what you can do and evil dead one was like film students putting the shit together yeah so yeah like intruder Mm-hmm. <laughs> intruder had that vibe we like that shit me too this and mandy uh, of the horror movies are like my all-time favorites i get to rewatch mandy i fucking love mandy like it is just so it's such a beautiful movie again 
it does so much work. There's so much symbolism and so much uh, vis visible, like aesthetic to it as well. But Mandy does bring all of it together in the lore element that this one doesn't. Yeah. But this one is just so fucking funny. And I love that. I love that it can be funny and like creepy at the same time and like genuinely yeah. unnerving at times. No, for so. sure. Because like we like to laugh. Mm -hmm. We're not just about spooky business. We like to laugh. And in the meantime, you can find us on the interwebs at ghostinthemagazine.site. Um, you can find the podcast on Twitter at GITM Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Witch X Pudding. And you can find me at Nocturnical. Okay, bye.